What's up, everybody? Welcome back to some more DraftKings MMA DFS picks and lineup advice, best bets, predictions, and some fan duel tips for UFC Vegas 88. Ty Tuivasa versus Martin Tabora. Welcome. I'm Brian Jester, co-founder here at Occupy Fantasy, joined by Jake the Snake, owner of MMADFS.com. Now, we're doing this a little earlier than usual. Typically, we put these out Friday nights or Saturday mornings, but due to some scheduling changes, we are putting this out Friday morning, which doesn't mean anything at all could possibly change in UFC over the next 24 hours, but we'll do what we can to break down the slate. Jake, what's up, man? Not a whole lot, man. Uh, pretty interesting slate for DFS, I think. Absolutely. So we have a good number of fights, a couple newcomers, a lot of fighters who have less than four fights in the UFC, and a pretty volatile main event. So what we'll do is we will break down that main event in this video. We will talk about those three newcomers and their backgrounds, play good fighter, bad fighter, good matchup, bad matchup to give context to those fighters with left less than four fights in the UFC, some context to their fight logs and their DraftKings points per game. And then we'll give you an underdog play of the week, a fight that you have to target in DFS, and our stream parlay of the week, which uh, was good from the very first second of the slate last week, and we had hope until the very end of the slate, so it was a very long sweat. Unfortunately, we did not come away with the parlay win last week. We'll try to get it back this week. Uh, so, Jake, let's talk about this main event, Tuivasa and Tabora, two heavyweights, uh, guys that have been around. If you've been watching the UFC, you probably know what both these guys are made of. Uh, but what do you see breaking down the tape? How do you see it playing out for DFS? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward fight, right? We know who these guys are. Ty is a big power puncher, you know, typically round one, KO or bust, uh, sort of fringe, whether or not he can be useful if he gets a second round knockout. Still only 30 years old, but he's been finished in three straight fights. We've seen him go on losing streaks before and bounce back. Uh, um, we'll see how he looks here. He did tear his meniscus during training camp in late December. Um, that's not the longest recovery time, you know, it's like a few weeks, six weeks or something, but still sort of concerning when you're trying to get ready for a big fight, especially a fight where you're going against a wrestler where you've historically struggled off your back and you're spending your time doing rehab opposed to wrestling training. Um, so definitely not ideal there. And I would say just makes it an even more volatile fight where he's even more KO or buff, you know, he needs to knock out Tybora before he gets taken down because when he gets taken down, he really struggles to get off his back and he's been pretty fortunate to face a lot of strikers lately but when he did face wrestlers grapplers earlier in a career in his career he did struggle um so we've seen him have issues when he's gone against guys like this uh he's just one in five in his career in fights that have made it past the seven minute mark um he had that one decision win over arlovsky back in the day and other than that it's either get the early knockout or slow down and get finished later on. And I think I think it plays out pretty straightforward like that. You know, you play Ty for his early KO ability, or you play Ty Burra for his ability to wrestle, get the fight to the ground, land ground and pound, and probably get a finish of his own. More likely in the middle rounds for Ty Burra. It's not impossible he gets the first round finish, but his style is just to wear on guys, outlast them. And, you know, he doesn't land like crazy ground and pound. He's just more relentless ground and pound where guys aren't getting – up and then eventually the ref stops the fight. Tybura is up there in age, 38 years old. Uh, you know, he gets cracked. We just saw him get knocked out by Aspinall. Five knockout losses on his record. So, like, obviously that's concerning going against a big power puncher. So I would call it a super volatile fight. Uh, the odds have been moving in Tybura's favor. I got him at plus 115 earlier in the week. Uh, it's negative 110 now, a straight pick him. I think there's some growing concern probably over the knee injury. Like, Ty put out a whole uh, like video like about the knee injury, which is sort of weird. Normally, fighters kind of hide injuries, and this dude's like doing a documentary on his injury. Uh, definitely unusual. Uh, that'll probably push more people onto Tybura, which you could argue uh, adds to to Avasa's tournament appeal, just because he might be a little bit lower owned with you know with this video circulating that he was coming off a knee injury. But I mean, I still think both guys are going to be in the low thirties. Um, so it's it's not like either is going to be low owned, but neither is going to be super high owned. So they're both they're both playable. I don't think you can stack this fight in low risk. The loser is probably going to score very few points, and the winner is probably going to score around a hundred. So it's definitely not a a fight where both guys are going to score well, or we're going to see like two hundred combined points. Uh, I actually feel confident this time. I know we say that occasionally, and it doesn't pan out. And we see these five round decisions. This would be shocking if this turned into a five round decision. 
<laughs> and if it did, it would probably be like the Alameda uh, Derek right. Lewis fight where one guy's on his back the whole time. Yeah, and still scores 10 so, points. So. <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah, I don't think you, you really want to play either guy in low risk, um, which kind of makes it a not great low risk week in general. But at the same time, you can build low risk lineups and just leave this fight out because there are some fighters that seem uh, pretty trustworthy and we have some dogs with high floors. So, yeah, I think you just don't play this fight in low risk. In high risk, you're almost treating it like a three-round fight, you know? Like, Ty, the extra rounds don't really help him. I guess, theoretically, Ty Bora, it eliminates a lower-scoring three-round decision for him, like, if he somehow just controlled the fight the whole time. So it adds to Ty Bora's floor and ceiling, but the extra rounds don't really do anything for Ty. Um, so you don't have to have one in high-risk contests. I think theoretically, Tabora could control Tuivasa for the whole first round, and then Tuivasa lands an early second round knockout and scores like 95 points, and it's just barely not enough to get in winning lineups. But you probably want to have healthy exposure to both sides, but not necessarily lock a spot in for tournament lineups. I think that's fair. I think it's a very uh, astute breakdown from all angles, from low risk and high risk. I'll ask you this question, Jake. You're playing 150 lineups, and your only choices were lock in Tabora, lock in to Ivasa, or completely fade the main event. As of Friday morning, which one would you choose? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be Tybora just because, you know, like, if he wins, he's probably in the winner at 7,900 on DraftKings. And I picked him to win. Uh, you know, I think he just needs to avoid getting knocked out. <laughs> That's fair enough. That is certainly fair. So, all right, let's move on. And let's talk about the three newcomers on this card. And we'll start from the first fight of the night until the last fight of the night. And we have... I don't want to disrespect any Cypriots out there, but at least since we've been tracking the first fighter from Cyprus in the UFC, Charles Lampos, Gregorio, he's making his debut against Chad and Helliger. Jake, what have you seen from Gregorio? I think there was one fighter from Cyprus a while back, but yeah. I don't remember his name. But I just remember Gregorio bringing that up because someone else was like, you're the first guy from Cyprus. He was like, no, there was one other guy. Like, he's on the... Yeah, multiple people are probably going to say that. But either way, second guy from Cyprus. Um yeah, I don't know. Not the most impressive guy. 31 years old, 8-3, and three, 6 knockouts, coming off like a 60-second round one TKO win on the Contender Series that some would argue was a quick stoppage. I mean, it shows he's got decent power, but that's kind of his main thing. He comes from a karate background. When he came to the U.S., he said his wrestling was really lacking, which is why he came to the U.S., because there just wasn't the right wrestling and grappling training in Cyprus. So he came to Thuralongo in New York. So he's training with a bunch of good wrestlers, you know, like Aljo, like Marab was there before, a bunch of other guys. So he has good training partners, and he should be improving in that area in his game. We have seen him landing takedowns. He's not really a submission threat on the mat. He'll just mix in takedowns and look for ground and pound, but still primarily a striker. Um, and I would say for DFS, he kind of looks like, you know, an early knockout or bust. He slows down a little bit later in fights. He is a karate black belt. Uh, yeah, he's shown some improvements, but overall not the most impressive guy. Um, and he hasn't faced much in the way of competition outside of uh, Christian Rodriguez, who actually knocked him out at, well, TKO finish, whatever you want to call it. Standing round three TKO uh, in 2021. And I mean, Christian Rodriguez absolutely dominated this guy in that in this fight. And given that's like his one fight where he had like legitimate competition that's definitely concerning because he's been beaten up on a bunch of the low level guys but how was he actually going to fare in the ufc what improvements has he made over the last few years since he got dominated by rodriguez i mean christian rodriguez is good you know he's on this card he's fighting isaac Belgarian up a weight class so yeah i mean it happens people lose to rodriguez it doesn't mean they're terrible but it's definitely not uh you know super encouraging so i think the jury's still out on gregorio we need to see more from him and we need to see him fight legitimate competition and see how he how he looks because i definitely see some holes in his game but uh you know he's still evolving that's fair enough and uh yeah if you know christian rodriguez basically his entire job in the world is just knocking down young prospects anyways right and so just got Gregorio right. a little earlier than some of these other guys he's been facing he'll try to do that challenge again uh this week against Bulgarian moving on we have a short notice replacement Mitch Ramirez he's fighting Thiago Moises he's one of the biggest underdogs on the card Jake what have you seen from Ramirez yeah not very impressed by this guy 31 years old eight and one with seven finishes like you said making a short notice UFC debut after Brad Riddell dropped out of this fight uh, I think it was announced like two weeks out uh yeah this guy you know people talk about like the best base for mma is it wrestling is it striking so this guy was like a heroin addict that went to prison for three and a half years and that's where he found mma so you know different base than a lot of people decent but base honestly not to, say, 
<laughs> uh, yeah, you know, we've seen a couple of guys like succeed with that base. I would say it's it gives you like a tough guy base, but it like from a technical standpoint, uh, a lot of a lot of these guys that learn to fight in prison or former drug addicts don't necessarily have the technical skills because they're just like i'm super tough i've been through a bunch of crazy shit like i'm not gonna give up and right. yeah i mean you know more power to him for that but at the same time I, i'm just not very impressed by this guy um so he got knocked out on contender series last august by carlos Prates. looked bad in that fight and that's basically the only legitimate opponent he's ever had um just before that he was like fighting at myrtle beach which sounds about right um <laughs> He's the boyfriend of Cynthia Calvillo, so I don't know if she, like, helped pull some strings to get him in this short-notice spot. We know the UFC loves to bring on siblings and significant others of UFC fighters, and a lot of the times these people are completely fraudulent, uh, and they're, they're only getting the opportunity because of who they know, so that could definitely be the case here, and I think it's a really tough spot for Ramirez. You know, he likes to wrestle a little bit. Moises is a much, much better grappler. If Ramirez tries to wrestle, he's going to get submitted. If he tries to strike, Moises will probably take him down and submit him anyway. So really tough spot for Ramirez, and I'm pretty low on this guy overall. Uh, not much more to say other than that. And let's move on to the guy you're probably the highest on on the slate. And I know you and I, at least our eyes perked up when we watched his contender series fight, just from the insanity and pure volume from Danny Silva. Whether or not he'll be a great UFC fighter remains to be seen, but I think it's something we have to take note of when it comes to playing MMA DFS on DraftKings and, and probably especially FanDuel. Yeah, I mean, for sure, we're, we're FanDuel, uh, you know, significant strikes, are they score better. Um, pretty crazy fight, right? Like, one of the craziest contender series fights of all time. So, the 27-year-old Danny Silva coming in 8-1 eight, eight and one with five knockouts. Like, four of his five fights have gone the distance. He landed 204 <laughs> significant strikes over 15 minutes on contender series. And he also absorbed 197. It was just, like, a crazy back-and-forth brawl. He even landed two takedowns, but he was not looking for any control time. He was just kind of mixing them in there just to keep the guy guessing. Uh, he did land a TKO just before that. But, yeah, I mean, overall, that was, that was sort of a weird fight. The guy, like, just kept getting, like, crazy hurt every time he touched him and then kept coming back up. Um, all of his other fights have gone the distance, though. Super boxing-heavy approach. He'll mix in takedowns, trains with Cub Swanson. So, you know, got a good coach around him. Uh, rarely landing finishes, but I don't think he needs them to score well as he showed in that in that last fight, especially when he's at a cheap price tag like he is here at 7,400. It's just nonstop pressure, marching forward, throwing strikes. He seems durable. Seems like he can take the damage coming back his way. And he's constantly keeping his opponents on the back feet so it's not like they're loading up with haymakers and connecting. It's just constant, constant volume. Uh, I mean, I feel like this guy is going to be everyone's new favorite fighter after they see him fight once. It is kind of a weird matchup, cool about super durable and also super low volume. So we'll see who can dictate the pace. You know, if Silva can force cool about into a high volume brawl, well, we should see a ton of striking. But if cool about can slow things down, you know, he's always got the potential to, to ruin a fight just based on his style. His fights always seem more exciting than they than they are on the box score. And then, you know, you see the striking totals and you're like, hey, like the Choi fight. You're like, how is there not more strikes than that? Like that was a crazy fight. But yeah, cool about how it's kind of a knack for, for for slowing things down and making them tougher. But yeah, I, I still think Silva will be able to force him into a brawl. And I mean, just absolute crazy volume. Like if you, like the, on this slate, you know, it's a Mike Davis slate. So you always have to go back and watch the Mason Jones, Mike Davis fight. And I was telling you, I was like, that was one of the craziest fights ever. Like Danny Silva landed almost twice as many significant <laughs> strikes on contender series than Mike Davis did against Mason Jones, which it's hard to even like know how that's even possible. Yeah. No, totally. And, you know, I, we're going to play Silva in this spot just because of the unknown and the potential. But it honestly might even be a better spot in this second fight if stuff gets slowed down by Cooley Bow here. He loses the decision or even wins a close one and scores like, you know, 60, 70 points. That'll still be useful on this slate. And we probably get him even low ownership and hopefully a better matchup in the second time. Absolutely. All right, so now let's play good fighter, bad fighter, good matchup, bad matchup. These are fighters that have less than four fights in the UFC. It is very simple. Is this fighter good or bad for DFS? Is this, is this fighter have a good or bad matchup on this particular slate? It just gives some context to their fight logs and their points per game. So we'll start again from the first fight of the night to the last fight of the night. Chad and Helliger, Jake. Yeah, I think he's, I think he's bad. Um, and 
probably a bad matchup. You know, it's a striking battle, but I'm not sure we'll see enough volume for him to get there. But and Helliger is fighting for his job. If he loses here, he's cut. 37 years old. He's fighting a newcomer. So, you know, there's some upside. He has a history of landing third round knockouts. Gregorio, we've seen slow down in the third round. So maybe he can get there on that. But uh, yeah, overall, I mean, it's all bad, bad. <laughs> the old bad, bad. All right, next we have uh, Jacqueline Amorim, who is in her third UFC fight. Uh, she's up against uh, McKenna here. Crazy swings for Amorim, right? Like, yeah. completely gasses out in her debut against Sam Hughes, blows it, loses a decision. After almost getting a finish in the first round that fight, comes back, absolutely dominates Montserrat Ruiz in her second fight. Montserrat's terrible, so it's like we don't even know if she's good or bad. But she's got good grappling, but it's a bad matchup because Corey McKenna is a wrestler. Although it hasn't fought in a super long time, it could be rusty. So a volatile, a volatile women's MMA fight. But I think I think Imarim's a good grappler, probably still pretty green and bad to mediocre in MMA, and it's a bad matchup. All right. Next we have uh Tafel Fio, who's up against Ode Osborne. Uh and Fio with similarly two crazy matchups in his UFC uh career so far. Yeah, for real. Like, Philo, you know, almost got the submission against Mikhaev, then gets submitted, almost gets knocked out in his next fight, then gets the submission. Like, really bad defense, but good offense on Philo. Like, all, almost all of his wins, all of his wins but one. 14 of his 15 wins have come early. Um, I think it's a good matchup. Osborne's been submitted three times, knocked out twice. So if you're looking to finish someone, I think it's a good matchup. I know Osborne's been working on his wrestling after he gets submitted in his last fight, but... um. I think for DFS, you still probably have to call Philo uh, a good DFS fighter. I'm not sure he's a good actual fighter and a good matchup. <laughs> All right, next. Uh, moving on, let's see here. Next, we have another matchup uh, with a fighter with two fights and a fighter with three fights, another women's, women's MMA fight, Chelsea Chandler and Josiane Nunez. Man, this is a fun fight, right? Um, super volatile. They're both cutting down from 145 to 135, adds even some additional volatility, but... I mean, it's a low-level fight, and I mean, they're both probably bad, but it's, it's a great matchup. You know, Nunez is just crazy nonstop by uh, volume, striking volume, doesn't do anything in terms of grappling. Chandler will mix in takedowns, really good with ground and pound, we'll look for submissions. So I mean, we almost saw Chandler get knocked out by Norman DeMont in the first round, and DeMont's like a decision machine. Right. So already durability concerns now cutting an additional weight demont said she walks around like 165 which is or not walks around but on fight day is 165 which is crazy demont or chandler you know she has to weigh in it i'm sorry chandler okay. yeah still thinking about demont yeah demont probably walks around like 185 <laughs> um chandler Ch chandler said that on fight night she's normally 165 which is crazy cutting down to 135 that gives some concerns over her chin uh so you have to think it's a good matchup for Nunez just on the KO potential, the volume potential. And it's a great matchup for Chandler to get Nunez down. So high wrestling upside. So good matchup for both of them. They're both still low level fighters, but yeah, great matchup all around. Yeah. That one should be a banger for as long as it lasts. Uh, next we have Natan Levy who uh, hasn't also fought in a long time. He's up against Mike Davis here. Yeah, man, both these guys are coming off, uh, you know, 532-day layoff for Davis, 469 days for Levy. Just crazy layoff. Neither guy fought in 2023. Um, you know, Levy has found success against super low-level opponents with his wrestling, but I think I still think he's a bad fighter. I think this is a bad matchup. Davis is good. It's just concerning how infrequently he fights. So you never know, like, if one guy's going to come with ring rust or an injury or i mean it's just it's so much time off it's crazy davis fights like once every 500 days <laughs> do you think there's a chance in smaller contests i haven't looked at our ownership yet for large field do you think there's a chance in smaller contests levy gets steamed up a little bit especially in higher dollar ones because of the quote-unquote floor his wrestling floor that he presents at 7k i know he was popping in projections and he's cheap um so probably uh, but it's it's tricky because there's also so few options at the top that I think people will be trying to jam Mike Davis. Mm. So I think that'll that'll kind of keep Levy in check. But uh, I think overall the fight's going to be popular. So you stack this fight is what, is what you're saying. <laughs> I can I considered stacking it in, in uh, cash. I'm not going to lie. I was looking at it. I was like, wait, do we stack this one? I knew, I knew it was on your mind for sure, especially with the price differences. So, uh, all right, next, uh, we've talked about Christian Rodriguez and his matchup here against uh, another young, exciting prospect, Isaac Dolgarian. Probably his toughest matchup to date, I would say, but I'm curious to get your take. Is Dolgarian 
as good as his fight logs and his debut indicates. And I assume this is a bad matchup against Rodriguez, but it is up a weight class too. Yeah, man, it's tricky, right? I mean, whenever you have a guy that's never been out of the first round, you want to assume they have bad cardio. And we've never seen – we've never even seen this guy forced into a striking battle. He gets everyone down, takes them down, finishes up in round one on the mat, normally with ground and pound, sometimes with submissions. So, like, coming into his first fight, I was looking to sort of fade Dalgarian because I thought Francis Marshall was pretty good and could take him into the second round. And then we'd see what Dalgarian had. And Dalgarian just – Immediately lands a takedown, beats him up with ground and pound, finishes him late in round one, made Francis Marshall look absolutely terrible. And I, I think Francis Marshall is a decent fighter. So that that was pretty impressive because before that, Dolgarian had never fought anyone decent. So it was a lot easier to think, well, okay, maybe he's a fraud. And we still don't know what his striking looks like. We still have no idea what his cardio looks like. But he trains at elevation, which is encouraging. You know, he, he trains with uh, Yusuf Zalal, which is like a cardio machine i think that's encouraging for his cardio like delgarian's talked about how like, he's training in five round training sessions like he just hasn't had to show so many of these things yet and i know all of his training partners talk really highly about him he's got a credentialed celebrated wrestling background so i think i'm sort of willing to give this guy the benefit of the doubt no we haven't seen him striking we haven't seen him in a later fight it's obviously the toughest matchup of his career. Christian Rodriguez is really good, but Christian Rodriguez is also coming up from 135 pounds. And I don't think there's going to be a size difference. I think both guys are listed at the same height, same reach. I think either one of them could make 135. Delgarin's even talked about like, yeah, I could make 135. I don't cut very much weight, but I have no reason to move down. I'm killing everyone at 145, which is fair. Right. So I don't know if the moving up a weight class really matters that much. But we have seen Christian Rodriguez struggle with being taken down. And I think Delgarian is going to be able to land the takedowns um, for that for that reason. I mean, we thought we saw Jonathan Pierce struggle at times against Christian Rodriguez, but still overall dominate that fight on the mat, even though he almost got guillotined a couple of times. I think Delgarian has good head placement on his takedowns. He's going to put his head right in Rodriguez's chest. He's not going to give the guillotine opportunities, I don't think. Um, so man, I think Delgarian's good. It is a tough matchup, but I do think Delgarian can find wrestling success and potentially still score well in the decision, assuming he doesn't gas out, which we really don't know. I mean, that's the wild card. Absolutely. No, that's a really good breakdown, Jake. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're so quick to just assume that they can't have cardio, but some good research there shows that, you know, maybe that's not the case with this guy. And uh, just because we haven't seen doesn't doesn't necessarily mean they don't have it. Uh, and it seems like there are some, uh, some data points here that it seems like he does have. But again, we'll see. I, I would love to see it. So uh, I think that is it. No, we have one more. We have Anj Lusa, who has also been involved in some absolutely just nutso fights in the UFC. Uh, is he good or bad? Is this a good or bad matchup against Brian Battle? I mean, when it comes to DFS, Anj is definitely good. He's pushing a crazy pace, tons of wrestling, striking volume. I mean, it's a DFS goldmine whenever he fights because he's either going to win a wrestling-heavy decision or basically, you're going to have to finish him. And he's never been finished before, but he hasn't, he hasn't been tested a ton. I know he fought Jack Della on Contender Series. Didn't get finished by him. I guess that's pretty fairly impressive. Um, but, you know, like Reese McKee is super low level. A.J. Fletcher, super low level. And A.J. Fletcher almost finished on Lusa, except for then he gassed out because that fight was at elevation in Salt Lake City. He had Lusa done in the second round. If he doesn't gas out, I think he finishes Lusa. Um, Reese McKee had Lusa really badly hurt in the final minute of that last fight, runs out of time. So, I mean, Lusa's been durable and has never been finished, but I do think the finish is coming sooner rather than later. Um, and I think he does slow down later in fights. And that basically means, like, either Battle's going to finish this guy and score well, or Lusa is going to win another wrestling-heavy decision and score well. We saw our Renat Fakhrdinov dominate Brian Battle on the ground. Um, I'm not saying Luce is as good as we're not, but at least we've seen it in the past where, you know, Battle has shown upside for his opponents when he can't land a finish. But I like Battle to get a finish here. I think a second round submission is definitely in play. Battle has some like thick ability to just land second round submissions against everyone. I like, it's the craziest like battered ever. Um, I just think it's the fact that he's wearing on guys and then like they leave their necks open in round two and he's good at like finding the neck. All right, so we've talked about all the fighters, basically, on the card, seemingly, at this point. And we'll close out the show with an underdog play of the slate, fight that you have to target in DFS, which you may have deduced 
by this point so far and our stream parlay of the week. Before we get to those final three segments, make sure you check out Jake's site, MMADFS.com for the sheet, all of his premium content for betting and DFS. Again, if you want that extra edge, you like watching our free videos, you want every possible ounce of information to help build your UFC DFS lineups or make some bets, check out Jake's site and check out OccupyFantasy.com where we have the daily plug, Occupy model, and lineup builder. Every tool you need. And there was a lot of uh, sites out there now pushing MMA DFS. No better value than both of our sites in combination, uh, in conjunction with this video to help you win. And uh, we've got the biggest winners when it comes to MMA DFS. So check out our sites. All right, so Jake, enough touting. Let's talk about Underdog Play of the Week. If you haven't already, if you're watching this, you can sign up for Underdog Fantasy using promo code OCCUPY. Get a 100% deposit match bonus up to $100. Best ball, uh, pick them slips, parlays, everything you need. So Jake, which play stood out to you the most this week? Yeah, I like Danny Silva over 50 and a half significant strikes. If he can just land a quarter of as many <laughs> as he did in the last fight, he can get there. Yeah, that's very fair. Uh, 50 and a half seems very generous. Again, we'll see how uh, cool about if he can slow this contest down. But again, if it goes to decision, 50 seems very well in play for Danny Silva. Uh, and we've talked about basically every fight so far, but which fight are you targeting the most in DFS that whoever wins is likely to be in the optimal lineup? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple, but we just talked about my favorite, Brian Battle. Ange Lusa. I think it's it's hard for this fight to get left out unless Lusa controls him for round one. Brian Battle gets like a early defensive round two submission and scores like 90 points, which is definitely possible, but you still have to like the floor and ceiling for both guys. Fair enough. All right. Stream parlay of the week. Uh, we talked about the main event at the beginning of the show. I said our Occupy model has Tabor ranked above Tuivasa, which is generally a good sign for underdogs. And now I don't even know if he's considered an underdog anymore. The line is basically flipped in Tabor's favor. Uh, so very safe in terms of uh, probability here, Jake, I'll go to Bora Moneyline for my side of the stream parlay. Yeah, you can still get it as a slight dog, negative 105 on DraftKings, the smallest possible dog. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, I'll match it up with Danny Silva decision. Just keep that theme going. Uh, plus 350 on Silva decision, which I really like is both guys go to so many decisions. And I just think it's hard for someone that lands that much volume to lose unless he absorbs a crazy amount of damage, which certainly possible but give me plus 350 on him all day uh that brings us to plus 778 on the parlay all right we can buy a nice little electric scooter with that parlay if it hits so uh and we'll save a, a more in-depth one for the daily plug and perhaps for future slates so that'll do it for this video make sure you are subscribed to the channel again normally we do these videos friday night or saturday morning sometimes it's earlier sometimes it's later but subscribing is the best way to get notified when they're published on the channel or when we go live it's free to do so and it helps support the channel give us a thumbs up if you like the ufc content uh any questions it will be difficult to monitor the channel uh we'll see if we can get jake on monitoring the channel if you have any comments or questions you can always drop them below the video or more importantly in the best way and to have in-depth conversations with us and other members of the community is join our discord server occupyfantasy.com slash discord the link is in the description below so for jake i'm brian thank you for listening and good luck at ufc vegas 88